Welcome to a brand new episode of Radical Math Talk, the show for the revolutionaries in math education. I'm your host, Kwame Sarfa Mensa. And if this is your first time tuning in to this podcast, I welcome you and I hope that you'll return for future episodes if you like what you see today or here. And if you are a returning listener or viewer of the podcast, as always, I welcome you back. And I hope that today's episode is one that you find informative, enlightening, and insightful. So before we get to the main event, please, if you are on YouTube, make sure you hit the red subscribe button so you can get future notifications on future episodes of not just this podcast, but our flagship podcast, I Dang Talk for Educators Live. Also, if you're listening from Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast, make sure you subscribe there as well. We love to increase our viewership and listenership. And if you are somebody who loves the content from our platform so much that you want to contribute to the growth of it monetarily, uh, we do have Cash App and Venmo available for donations. So if you're on Cash App, you could just hit that handle, money sign, ID talk for Ed. If you are on Venmo, the handle will be at Kwame SM. So that's K-W-A-M-E-S-M. Thank you kindly. So whew, we've had some great episodes to start this podcast off, and I'm just blessed to have the guests that we've had up until this point. Uh, today's episode is going to be all about how resourceful we can be as math educators. So, so often uh, we have usually have two different kinds of educators in general. You have educators who are very much, I'm going to stick to the script, whatever I'm being told to do as far as what to teach, that's what I'm going to follow. And then there's some who are more on the autonomous side of things. They like to operate with more freedom. They want to operate um, with just a hands-off approach where they can take the curriculum and be innovative and creative however they want. And today is going to be all about the art of teaching, particularly in a math classroom, because so often we hear about the creative ways in which teachers are able to deliver instruction in other content areas, but we don't hear it as often in the math context. So I have a guest today who is an innovator, she is a designer, and she just does a lot of dope things as far as creating materials in the math classroom. And most importantly, and I'm biased for saying this, but she's a middle school math teacher. And as a fellow middle school math teacher, um, it's always dope to have these conversations with somebody who is teaching the same curriculum and is with the same type of students um at that level so without further ado uh, i want to bring on asia hines to the podcast to talk with us about how we can be more creative with our pedagogy but also with the materials that we use to um assess and evaluate how our students are learning in math so let's let's bring asia on to talk with us hey asia hi kwame how we doing Doing well, doing well. It's a beautiful Sunday here in Virginia. How mm. are you? I cannot complain. Um, everything is looking on the up it up in Boston. Weather's getting nicer and spring is just about here. As far Slowly. as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> well, but once again, thank you for coming on a radical math talk. Um, I've been excited to have this conversation with you because you just do a lot of amazing things in terms of just how you create materials. And that's something that I think is a lost art, um, especially when we're in our pre-service stage of becoming educators. We don't really get the opportunities to be super innovative in how we go about doing the work. So true. So I want to start from the beginning. So one thing that I have my guests do is to share mathography. So every math educator that I have on this show pretty much shares their math story of how they got started, um, what led them to math, 
and most importantly, how they evolved as math teachers or in the process. So it could be from your upbringing, certain experiences you've had leading up to where you are today, however you want to take it. So I want to just give you the floor to just share your mathography uh, with the audience and so they can get a sense of who you are and, and how you show up in the space. Okay, so hi everyone. As Kwame already said, my name is Asia Hines. Um, I have been a seventh grade teacher in Northern Virginia for six years. I did five years in math, and then this year, actually, I added on science to my experience. But I will be going back to all math next year. So I am cre I am obsessed with creating math resources, increasing student engagement in my math class, um, and helping teachers create math resources in their own classrooms. So I kind of fell into the math education space six years ago, actually, as a student teacher. At that time, I started a teacher Instagram, and most of Teachergram at the time was all about teacher outfits, and so that's what I started with, and the outfits were not very great, so I stopped. Um, once I finally got my first classroom, I transitioned to sharing peaks into my classroom, showing my students working in their notebooks, um, our activity for the day, and just typical things of them being in action, and sprinkled in a few classroom DIY projects that I was doing at the time. Since then, I've become much more intentional about what I share with the full purpose of serving my audience and helping other teachers, whether they are novice teachers or veteran teachers. Um, so I really started taking my online presence more seriously back in early 2020. And I started my blog in May of 2020 and started consistently creating math resources, not only for my classroom, but for teachers around the world. Um, and the reason I got started with creating math resources is because I'm in Virginia and we are not a common core state. And I found that most of the resources that were given to us and also available in Teachers Pay Teachers, they did not apply uh, to our state standards. And the Virginia state standards are very different from Common Core, I would say. They're a little more streamlined and easy to understand. Uh, for example, in my first year teacher, I'd be scrambling at the last minute to come up with a lesson. I'd find something on Teachers Pay Teachers, for example, one step equations. I would assign it without looking at every single problem first, which I don't recommend. Um, and then shortly after my students would start, they'd be like, uh, we don't know how to do this one. And then it just kept happening. There would be questions on there that did not apply to the learning that we were currently do doing. So how did math come into my life? Uh, it has always been my favorite subject, mainly because I was good at it and it made sense to me. I knew I wanted to be a seventh grade math teacher, actually, after being in seventh grade math. Uh, when I was in seventh grade, I met my favorite teacher, Miss Parker. And she just had a magical way of teaching that made me want to learn. Uh, she told a story along with just about every single lesson, and it really made it stick um, and made it memorable. So that's truly when I fell in love with math. And Ms. Parker is who inspired me to become a math teacher. Uh, when I was younger, though, I would also play school a lot. And that's basically how I learned math, being able to teach it to pretend students. And so I looked forward to homework because I could go home to my basement classroom and teach my dog and my stuffed animals while I did my homework. So I've always been a lover of math. Awesome. Awesome. So you did mention that Virginia has their different, has a different type of standards. And I know this just from firsthand experience because I actually traveled to South Boston, Virginia, Halifax County to do a workshop for some teachers in that district. And that's when I realized, oh, we do the Virginia standards of learning. And, you know, I'm coming from a common core state. Mm -hmm. And I know that 90 plus percent, percent of this country does common core in some shape or form or some iteration of it. So that was my firsthand experience with that. But I wanna ask a question about your process for understanding what exactly you have to teach. Because in order to really deliver the best instruction, it's not just about the content knowledge and math. You have to really have an understanding of what the standards are. 
and and how to unpack the standards. So I really want to get a sense of what your process is. I know for me, whenever I come across a standard, I'm usually looking at a few things. I think one, the verb. Mm -hmm. I think the verb gives me an idea of, of what it is that I need to do, but I'm also like annotating for different aspects of it that I want to make sure I highlight. And then sometimes I'll go on a Google search and just look at different ways in which the standard is being taught, whether it's through different materials. I might even go on Teachers Pay Teachers to see how different people are doing it to get a sense of what the, the cognitively demanding levels are. Mm -hmm. Is this like too easy or, or is it way too challenging? And also accounting for the students I have in front of me because I taught in an inclusive classroom. So I had students with IEPs, I had students who had 504 plans. So there are a lot of things I was that was in the gumbo, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, before you even start creating the material from math, what's the process you go through when you're looking at a standard? Okay, so, and it's great you asked this question because, yes, Virginia standards are so different. Um, and so that's where I really started. I printed out every like curriculum guide I could find for the county, but also, or not the county, for the state. And then I would research different counties because different counties provide different things for their teachers in Virginia. Um, and in addition to that, I would read every blog I could find like at the mm -hmm. beginning of each unit for example, multi-step equations, and then break that down. And this is definitely something that I developed over time. I won't say that I was good at it at all in probably my first two years of teaching, um, but you've really got to just be able to pull apart the standard. And like you said, the verb. Um, so what I do is we're actually standards-based grading at my school now. I have been for a few years. So I focus on the learning target. So looking at the verb, what exactly will my students need to be able to do. And then I just kind of plan out kind of like a roadmap, like what are the pre pre, uh, pre or prior knowledge skills that they must know in order to even be able to understand this. So that's where I start. So I do look at a lot of vertical articulation. So go back to sixth grade and see what is it that they have um, already learned as it relates to this topic. And then I just, like I said, pull apart that standard and start with the basics to see where they are. And then same, I have inclusive classrooms. So students are on all types of levels of learning usually. And so the way I try my best to help alleviate that is to differentiate from the start. Um, so with my lessons, I make sure that it's accessible for all students um, from the guided notes. And then I do differentiate with like levels of activities. Um, so I call it kind of like hot wings. So we have like the mild, medium, and spicy. So mild, you know, it's a little easier. Medium right there in the middle. And then spicy is for the kids that need a challenge. Um, but yeah, I really pull out the learning targets and I frame each lesson around a particular simple learning target from the standards. And when you are creating your materials based off of these standards, is there ever a fear of over scaffolding your... Um, resources because i know in the resources that you you have mm -hmm. there are a lot of scaffolds built in right so you mentioned guided notes as an example but you have uh, other features that are within these uh, materials do you ever look at something that you created and you just say to yourself man maybe i i went a bit too far with the guided notes or i went a bit too far with this scaffold to where I'm not giving students the opportunity to really think critically about the concepts they're learning. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I actually just finished reading a book that is very popular in the math space right now is building thinking classrooms. And it does have me going back and reflecting like, okay, am I leaving opportunities for them to think on their own? Um, and so I do still incorporate that, you know, with like challenge questions, but the main purpose I think for my guided notes is for them to have something to refer back to when they are doing practice. So I don't really use my textbook at all. So that's kind of how my guided notes work is like, okay, well, what did Ms. Hines say about this? I don't have her sitting next to me right now, but I can refer back to these notes and pull out what I need. But it is, it's crucial to have students thinking um, and actually coming up with 
the why on their own. So I can definitely say that I need to do a better job of being intentional with that. Yeah. And I think it's hard to do that because as middle school math teachers, we get them coming out of elementary school. And it's usually during elementary school where they learn those foundational concepts. So if you're getting students that, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, some of them aren't coming in with certain gaps. And I know I've experienced it as a seventh, eighth grade math teacher. I'm supposed to be getting prepared for algebra when they go to high school, but I have kids with fraction phobia. I have kids who run away when they see a decimal, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have to spend some time or find time within my instructional period to address those uh, prerequisites, whether it's through a guided math block or small group instruction and, and the different things I've done in the past. So I'm wondering whenever that occurs, how are you able to find time within your instructional block to address those gaps that do hinder our math learners at the middle school level from learning the skills we have to learn on grade level? Yeah. So I wish there was a perfect answer of, oh yeah, yeah build in this class time. But we all know that's the main thing with math classes. We just don't have the time. Right. And the content is what feels like endless. So it's like, how do I go back and hit these skills while also, you know, finishing the curriculum. Um, I'm fortunate in that my school does have an additional period for us where it's kind of like a study hall. We actually call it independent study. Um, and so at that point, I can pull students from other classrooms and work with them a little more one-on-one -on -one or in small groups at that time. Um, but yeah, I, I do a lot of spiral review throughout the year, which is spiraling to concepts we learned early in the year, but also to sixth grade and like basic skills that they should have. Um, and so I use that. And also when we do have that extra time, which again is rare, any like practice that I can give them, whether it's like a look at activity of multiplication facts, <laughs> we did that a lot. But yeah, I have not found the fix for the fraction phobia beyond just showing a lot of fractions. If we're doing equations, they're gonna have equations with fractions in them. So the mm -hmm. only way to conquer that fear is to constantly see it. Um, and I get it. My sister was telling me she didn't start understanding fractions until 11th grade. And she's, you know, very accomplished now. So it's possible. They just gotta, we gotta see them and experience them. Yeah. And you know, I'm guilty of that as well, especially when it comes to solving equations, multi-step equations. I don't throw in fractional coefficients until later on. So I mm -hmm. stick with the whole number ones yeah. until they get comfortable. And then when I see that, oh, like we getting it. All right, I'm gonna throw y'all a fractional coefficient. Mm -hmm. And it's like their whole world collapse. Yeah. What is this? I was like, hold up, <laughs> like, up y'all. It's the same steps we've been yeah, doing. Listen, we're still dealing with the inverse operation. We're still you know, doing that on both sides of the equation, nothing has changed. It's just that we have a fractional coefficient. Yes. It, it, yeah, <laughs> it is. And it's funny because like I've been teaching math for over a decade and it's still something that I've not yet quite mastered. Still working on it. <laughs> no, I agree. And much like the kids, when it's time to introduce it, to them with the fractions. I'm always nervous too, because it's like, okay, how can I best communicate this in a way that makes sense and doesn't like overwhelm them? So yeah, it's tough. It's definitely tough. Start out with those, you know, they all have the common denominator, make it a little easier, but yeah. yeah. I wish students did have more time to experience fractions before they got to us. And I, and I think for me, it takes more time to do that because like, I'll give another example when I'm teaching them about systems of equations, right? Mm. So we go through elimination, we go through substitution and then graphing, right? I have to do case by case. Like, let's say that you have a system that has two equations starting with Y equals. Okay. Like in that situation, because they're both equal to Y, you can equate those two equations to solve for x and y right right 
and those tend to be easier for them to do. But then if it's a case where I have, um, let's say, y equals, I don't know, 2x plus 1, and then 3x plus 3y is equal to whatever, I need for them to see that, hey, you already have one that says y equals 2. You can easily do substitution. So having to talk them through the process. So listen, for those who are not like math teachers, this may be like foreign and I apologize in advance, but for those who teach it, you understand where I'm coming from. There's like a whole dialogue that has to happen when you're teaching them that. And I think that's what makes it so complicated because that takes time. It takes time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Time. And we get better with time though. So <laughs> we sure do. But but let, let's talk about creativity for a second. So I, mm -hmm. I alluded to this earlier um, before we brought you on to talk that I feel like the way a lot of our school systems are, right? Wherever we are. Mm -hmm. It's as if the creativity and innovation is stripped from us from the moment we step through our classroom doors. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we have scope of sequences, which are great. But I feel like if we do something that deviates from it, it's viewed as being rebellious, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, we're not following the script or, to, or the traditional way of doing things. If we're not using the textbook, at least 80% of the time, something is wrong with us. Um, I know that's something that I've experienced mm -hmm. and I've had to, you know, challenge colleagues and even some of my administrators on it. Um, I'm not sure if you've been privy to those uh, battles or, or conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is definitely hard to be creative, but it's not it's not impossible. No. Um, so for me, I just let my students guide, guide the lessons um, and to inspire my creativity. So just by paying attention to them, it's probably easiest when we're talking about word problems. That's when I find it easiest to incorporate most creativity. Um, for example, to make it real and relevant for them. These, my students, they love LED lights. And a lot of them, I noticed when we were in Zoom uh, classrooms last year, a lot of them would have the LED lights like around their ceiling. And so an easy way to incorporate that into a problem is like, okay, we got to measure our ceiling and determine, do we need to buy two boxes or one box um, off of Amazon to determine if it would be enough to cover the ceiling. Um, and so that's an easy way to, you know, introduce a uh, surface area or just area to the kids. And yeah, so just ways like that, just listening to them, paying attention. I jot down notes every time I notice like, oh, they're interested in this or they're interested in that. And so just build that into the lesson. Right. And I think it's also relative to the students you have year by year, because each group of students you have have their different interest. Yes. So that's definitely a factor as well. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in Virginia, do you all have a teacher evaluation system where you have to submit artifacts of learning? Not really, not artifacts. We do keep track of data. Um, okay. So we have like the PGP professional growth reflection. So we just reflect on SMART goals throughout the year. Um, and so we set the goal at the start of the year, mid-year reflection comes around and we, you know, talk about, are we reaching that goal? Are we close to reaching it? But there are no real artifacts that are submitted beyond what a admin may take with them once they come and do an observation. All right. Because I know in Massachusetts, um, it's an artifacts based evaluation system where maybe every quarter of the year we have to submit artifacts. So you have people who are taking pictures of everything from their anchor charts to their bulletin boards uh, to exemplars of student work. And then they have to type up a rationale saying how this aligns with a goal that they have or 
a specific standard that is in the evaluation rubric. So that was something that we had to do on a quarterly basis throughout the year. So I'm thinking about the fact that you you have all these materials that would not have been a problem for you because you, yeah. you pretty much have all these materials at your disposal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to focus still on the creativity piece. Okay. There are a lot of not just math teachers, but teachers in general who feel like, you know what? I'm not really an artsy person. I'm not a creative person. Um, I don't have that that gene to just do these beautiful anchor charts and make it all colorful and aesthetically pleasing. So what do you believe are some of the barriers that deter math teachers in general from creating learning resources like the ones you create? Mm -hmm. So like you said, I think it all starts with mindset. And once you have that thought of I'm not creative, then you're probably not even going to try. And it's funny you say that, too, because I was just reading a book about teachers and creativity um, and what to, you know, how to respond when they say that. But I think the the issue is that they're not asking questions. Um, And so, for example, you got to ask yourself a question like, how can I make this concept make sense for students? Um, how can I make this lesson fun? Like, what ways can I bring in, like, you know, different features that'll make it more relevant for them? And so when it comes to creating supplemental learning resources, I think teachers do struggle with, first off, not thinking that they're tech savvy enough. Um, I won't say it's the creativity that they mostly struggle with, I think is the not knowing how to get started um, Mm. and not thinking that they have enough time. So the lack of time and not being tech savvy stops them. And then not knowing how to get started, but also not knowing how to make it look organized and look pretty. So for me, it was definitely like a learning curve. When I look back on how my resources started, it's like, oh, my God, this text is too small. My students could barely read it. Um, And like the spacing was off. But the the thing is, with math resources, it's even a little more challenging because we have like the fancy math symbols and you need to create graphs and inequalities. And a lot of teachers do not know how to do that. But it's actually much more simple than you would think. Um, And so I think with that, it's helpful to have that willingness to learn. Um, so for me, I used to watch a lot of, you know, YouTube videos, YouTube University, and I learned that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you just got to have that willingness to get started and to be teachable. But it's not impossible, teachers. And you don't have to be the most creative teacher to start. What you really need is to know your standards and to know your students. Um, you know what they need. And like we said, t- Groups of students are different year to year. And so with that, let them inspire your creativity. Talk to them. Or I talk to my students all the time and ask them, so what's something you like to do? Or also reflecting, what's a lesson that you really enjoyed this year? Um, What would you like to see more of? So those things, talking to the kids and just believing that you can do it. Like we teach the kids, you got to have that growth mindset, not fixed mindset. Um, And it's, it's not impossible. And it's actually more simple than you think. Awesome. And you're just about to answer uh, the next question. You actually started to answer it. So I wanted to give you the floor to continue. Okay. How do you learn who your students are as math learners? I think that is something that should be a starting point whenever you have a new group, rather than jumping into assessments and diagnosing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, how do we really learn how who our students are in the math context. Yeah. So in the math context and in a general context, so the first week of school, at least, as most teachers are told to do, I believe, um, you know, get to know your students. So I do that with interest surveys and the questions have a variety of things. Like how do you like to do independent work? Do you like music? Do you like it to be silent? Um, Do you like working in groups? Do you like working in partners? How do you feel about whiteboards? 
um, and games and such like that. So ask them for like, what games are you interested in? What do you like to do outside of school? And then I do attendance questions every day, which is not technically math related, but it's still like helping me like get those gears uh, turning for what they may be interested in. So my attendance questions are just like a would you rather question. Um, and I gather that data, you know, informally and keep note of what stuff they like. Um, and but the main way, honestly, is to just ask, like, continue having conversations with your students and take notes and notice, like, when they are most successful. So as they're doing independent practice or as you're doing a lesson or maybe coming up with a different analogy, see what they're clinging to and what is helping stuff like, you know, helping that light bulb go off for them. So just pay attention, really take notes. Yeah, I, I mean, pretty much, you know, that's a fact. Uh, and I don't think that's something that we do enough. And I love the fact that you mentioned the whiteboard question. That's something that I've never heard of before. Like I used to give students whiteboards. Mm -hmm. If we're doing, if we're doing like practice work, just for a quick check for understanding, but never have I considered that in an interest survey mm -hmm. questionnaire. So that's, that's actually interesting. I'm about to steal that one. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so when you are assessing the quality of your resources that you create, what are some of the key components that you're looking at when determining whether or not, okay, this is something I could definitely give to my students it is something that teachers can give to their students. Yeah, so I start with the standards, obviously. So I like do a check to make sure that it's accurately covering um, and explaining the standards so it makes sense for students. And so whenever I create a resource, I do print it out and I work through it myself. And so I, that helps me determine how much time it will take them to complete it. Um, and it also helps me determine is there enough spacing for them to show their work? Um, is this font easy to read or is it too fancy or too small? Uh, is this clip art developmentally appropriate or are they gonna like giggle at it? So a lot of the clip art you find out there is definitely for elementary school and doesn't work for middle school. So it's important to have clip art that works. Um, and then when I go into share and get with uh, teachers, I have to make sure that my answer key is accurate. So I usually go through the answer key at least twice to make sure I didn't make mistakes because after you look at the same problem for so long, that four starts to look like a five and you realize you did the entire question yeah. wrong. <laughs> um, and I've been in too many Facebook groups where teachers are posting pictures of a math problem and saying the answer key says this, but I keep getting this. Am I doing it wrong? Um, and oftentimes I have, and I like come in, I'm like, so, we are human. <laughs> we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's likely wrong. So don't doubt yourself as a teacher just because of a typo. Um, so those are the main things. I, I create things with students in mind. And that's how I got started with my guided notes. Because I would find a lot of guided notes out there that were just complicated, too complicated yeah. for them and too like fast paced. Like it dived into the tougher um examples too soon and so with the scaffolding you know we kind of build up to the tougher examples but I do think for math one of the main things is that space they need space and they need to read it so you got to consider students with like processing disorders too and so when I create resources I do try to think of all my accommodations uh closed notes is a big one so I have built that into my guided notes so it's automatically there to help those learners yeah, I did a lot of closed notes when I was creating my reference sheets. Mm -hmm. It's all right, we do it together, fill in that blank. Yeah. We're going <laughs> to do this thing together. Um, and yeah, they love those a lot. Matter of fact, I have high schoolers who still come back and they're like, hey, Mr. Sarfman, so do you still have those uh, reference sheets from when we were in middle school with you? Like, yeah. Like they still use them to this day. Wow. And doesn't that just make you so happy? Oh, man. Oh, it's the best. Cause I remember I used to keep some notebooks from teachers and it's like, I'm so glad I had this once I got to high school. Mm. Yeah, so that's huge. And are your students aware that you create these resources for other teachers? Like they're aware 
or nah? They are this year. Um, in the past, some of my students, because they have my copyright on them, they would start to notice the copyright. And kids are much more savvy now. I, you've probably heard that they'll like Google the copyright. The of course. The copyright keys. <laughs> um, so back then it just had the sassy teacher on the copyright. And they'd be like, who's the sassy teacher? And like one of my students figured it out. Um, so I started putting my full name. And the reason they discovered it this year is because other uh, teachers on my team have started using them. And so they'll be like, we're using something you made in our class. Um, and so that just warms my heart because they see my name at the bottom. So they know now um, that it's for other teachers. I don't know if they understand that I make money from it because that's not really something I talk about. Oh, no. Um, no. But one of my, actually one student, her mom, she said, uh, I was, her mom was a teacher and she's like, your teacher is on Teacher Pay Teachers. I've used some of her resources. And so that's just one. Um, but yeah, mostly this shit. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So I just keep thinking if, you know, when they see your materials and you're piloting them with them, obviously, mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder if they're like, Mm -mm, um, uh, Miss Hines, uh, yeah, you, you're gonna need to do something about this. This this ain't gonna work. You might need to change this. So, uh -huh. so when you pilot these resources with them, are they give you that kind of feedback, or are you are you saying, hey, what do y'all think about this? I usually ask them, and so. I'm like, so what did you think of that activity? Was, you know, like, I really just an open-ended, what did you think of that? Yeah. Um, and then was there anything too difficult or was it too easy? And I noticed like the worst thing in the world, and this actually happened recently, is when you spend like hours creating a resource and then it takes them like 10 minutes to complete it. Oh it's like, God. oh my God. And so that <laughs> is something I try to avoid. <laughs> But yeah, just getting that feedback. What did you think? What could be better? And seventh graders, they love to talk. They love to talk and they love to give feedback. So I'm definitely going to start asking that. I think I will start introducing like, oh, I share this with other teachers. What do you think other students would think? I'm going to mm. start doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's the worst feeling when you spend all that time creating the resource and then they get through it in 10 minutes and you don't have a plan B because you're expecting that resource to take you through majority of that instructional block. It's yeah. like, it's what am I going to do next? Exactly. I got love for y'all. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's the worst. Absolutely. That's the worst. <laughs> so um, what do you believe are the prerequisite traits teachers should have when they create these learning resources that you create? What do you believe are the prerequisites? I would say, first off, patience, because you got to have, it's very easy to get frustrated um, with like the spacing of things or maybe the time it takes. But if you have that patience and the ability to pull away and just finish it later, just know you don't have to finish in one, finish in one sitting. Um, next, they need the willingness to learn. So to learn the best, like, um, tool to use, whether that's Microsoft PowerPoint, my personal favorite, or Google Slides, depending on the type of resource it is. And yeah, so notice I did not mention creativity because that is not a prerequisite. You just have to have the patience and willingness to learn. And then if you have a guide like me, I can help you along the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I know that uh, you do offer, I believe, an e-course Focus on helping teachers create resources. So I don't know if you wanted to share a little bit more about that, because I think that's helpful, especially now in this yeah. um, landscape we're in. Yes. Yeah. So I do. I have a course, Resources Made Easy, where I teach teachers how to create digital and printable classroom resources and I'll equip them with the tools they need, how to dive into their standards and how to make it visually appealing using some of the same things that uh, advertising companies use. So just like the stuff you see in advertising, there's a reason for the colors they chose. There's a reason um, for the clip art and like visual aspects. And so my course will actually be reopening for new members at the end of June. All right, y'all heard the end of June, so. Summertime, y'all want some PD? Yeah, that you can they can get credit for mm -hmm. right here. 
Yay. Especially for those that are trying to renew those certifications. Boom. Put that on your, your list so you can get those hours. Yes, for sure. Um, I actually had one more question. This is specifically about Teachers Pay Teachers. Okay. Um, years ago, it's like 2012, I actually started a store on Teachers Pay Teachers where I would just put up you know, my reference sheets and I was teaching math and science at the time mm -hmm. uh, for a sixth grade class. And I didn't have any knowledge about, you know, creating answer keys and creating like the, the nice covers and things of that nature. I just pretty much uploaded whatever I was doing because mm -hmm. I thought that other people were doing that and they were getting paid off of it, right? And as I was looking through these resources, a lot of them, I just thought, man, like, yeah, they look nice, but some of the information is wrong on there and it's still selling, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I just want to know, like, are you that, are you that, um, for lack of a better term, the snob that kind of looks at other people's stuff, you're just like, oh, like, <laughs> Why are you using this font? Like, that's not even necessary. Like, why are you using cursive? Why is this clip art there? Like, that's, are you that critical when you look at other materials? I try not to be these days because <laughs> I know how I started. And like you, I was- You don't get irked? Like- <laughs> Oh, I, I yeah, yes, 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 <laughs> for sure. That, that's why I make my own. And that was part of the struggle. Like you download something or maybe, I used to get a lot of freebies. So I really wouldn't spend money on Teachers Pay Teachers for years. Mm -hmm. um, and even with the freebies, which is so snobbish to, you know, critique a freebie, but it's like some of them, like, this is it. It's just one page and it doesn't really have much value. And so, yeah, there are a lot of lower quality materials out there that you're right. They are selling and it's not fair. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> I just try to focus on what learn while well, taking notes of what not to do. So like you said, the fonts, like, that's really how I learned. Like, I'm like, okay, I know not to use that type of font in a resource because I know how it made me feel looking at it. So I just use those as opportunities to grow, <laughs> uh, seeing, you know, other resources that don't quite work. So yeah, Teachers Pay Teachers, it definitely has a learning curve for knowing how to get started. Because much like you, I did not know a cover was a thing or that thumbnails were necessary or that it needed an answer key. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I just felt like I was getting penalized for not having a nice cover. Like when I was getting the reviews, there was like, listen, this was great. I loved it, but we need the answer key. All right, no problem. I can give you the answer key. That wasn't really the issue. It was more about the fact that I didn't have like the nice cover. I think gotcha. that's why people weren't really purchasing um, the products, even though I, was, I still get, I still get a few coins Mm -hmm. from it yeah see the thing with that is you knew that your resource was helpful but it all goes back to advertising and marketing like you want people to come in the door so like you know if you have the choice of two doors would you go to the one that you know look basic black and white or would you go to the one with the the color um so yeah you are hiding that wonderful resource from your student well from your uh potential buyers just yeah. because of that the door, aka the cover. So, yeah. but now you know. I, I mean, still doing it. Maybe. I know now. I know now. I mean, that was ten years ago. Yeah. So like now, twenty twenty two. I've learned a whole lot about just making things aesthetically pleasing, and and if I were to do it again, like I would know how to go about doing it. But now I'm kind of at a stage where that's really not my focus. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there like yourself who do it so much better than than I could ever do it. And and I know where I am, you know, but <laughs> I know, but I know that if I really put my time and the effort in, oh yeah, like the resources are gonna be fire. Yeah. But hey, that's not my focus. It's not, yeah, not your jam. I get that. I get you that. I mean? Yeah. So your students are benefiting. That's all that matters. They've got those reference sheets. 
Uh, for sure, for sure. But yeah, Asia, this has been a great conversation. And, and I really hope that people do um, sign up for the Resources Made Easy e-course mm -hmm. uh, later on in the summer that you're offering because there are live teachers who I know could benefit from it greatly. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, before I let you go, we got to do a quick lightning round. So this is just an opportunity to have the audience get to know you a little bit more okay. outside of the math context a little bit. Uh, so I have a few questions and we can wrap it up there. So uh, first thing, what are you doing for self-care these days? I like going for walks. I love walking outside and I love having dance parties by myself. Mm. And would you say that the walks give you a lot of creative innovation? Because I know when I take a walk, ideas just start yes. flowing through your mind like it's nothing. Absolutely. That's definitely one of the ways that I do uh, inspire my own creativity. Going for a walk, listening to the, the bears. And then when I have that idea, I take out my notes app and jot it down. Right, right on the phone. Like I have it right on the phone. Uh -huh. Um. Favorite math concept to teach or learn about? Multi-step equations. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, most difficult math concept to teach or learn? I would say quadrilateral properties. Um, knowing that diag which diagonals bisect and which ones don't. I just don't see the value in teaching <laughs> about the quadrilaterals. So I never look forward to it. Yeah. So yeah, I don't really get into quadrilaterals like that neither. Like I'll let them know that hey, like the opposite angles mm -hmm. or opposite vertices, they're supplementary, so they add up to 180 degrees. Like I'll teach them that yeah, 360 for the whole thing, but I don't get into it like that. I don't know why. Yeah. See, Virginia, they make us teach it all the, uh, the nitty gritty. I think it's become helpful because I teach a high school geometry right now and uh -huh. we're learning about um, circumscribed angles, particularly quadrilaterals that are within the circle. So a lot of those concepts about bisection and things of that nature are coming into fruition. Okay. All right. So well, there, there's cool. a purpose. There's okay. Purpose. That's good to know. Yeah. If they remember it when they get there. <laughs> yeah. No, they don't remember it, but you got to reteach it for sure. But right. <laughs> there is a place for it. That I will say that. Okay. Um, favorite book to read, or maybe it's one that you're reading right now. So what I'm currently reading is High Performance Habits by Brendan Bouchard, and I'm really enjoying that thoroughly. So definitely recommend for anyone, not just teachers, anyone who wants to be a high performer in any area. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. um, are you a TV person? I am. All right. Um, favorite TV show or series that you're watching right now? So I love reality TV and one of my top reality shows is Married at First Sight. Can't get enough. I love the concept. And I also love Grey's Anatomy for regular TV. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my wife is a Grey's Anatomy fan. Now, you think it's going to end this season? No. No. It can never end. <laughs> oh, now you see what's going on with Meredith. You see what's going on with the you know, transition and all that. Career-wise, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how we can have a show without Meredith, but yeah, I hope it never ends. Yeah. But it definitely isn't the same as it used to be, but I'm still loyal. I'll stay loyal forever. Yeah. I mean, how do you create new storylines? At some point, they they get a little boring. I feel like they're, they're starting to recycle storylines. Even with the new characters, it's like, we've seen this storyline before mm -hmm. uh, with characters that aren't on the show anymore. So I don't know. You're right. You're right. It is getting difficult and a little deja vu-ish, but yeah. yeah, but it's still just such a good show. It is. It is. I mean, <laughs> that's why it's been on for what, 18? Yeah. 13, 18 seasons mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. I, mean, I think I was in college when it first started. So 
that just kind of tells you. Okay, wow. <laughs> in college, like junior, senior year, it came out because it's like 04. Yeah. 04, 05, around there. It's still going strong. Wow. Yeah. Um, if you could invite three influential figures, dead or alive, to dinner, who would they be? Okay. I would say Michelle Obama, because who wouldn't? It? Um, Brene Brown and Rita Pearson, uh, the lady from the TED mm -hmm. Talk, the famous teacher. Yeah, she was yeah. still here. So my wife and I are listening to Atlas of the Heart. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, we're listening to that right now. And my wife is a huge Brene Brown fan. She loves Brene Brown. Same. Yeah, Love her. She's, she's dope. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Asia, uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on a Radical Math Talk. And before you go, please let people know how they can connect with you on social media so they can support the work that you're doing. Okay. So on social media, you can find me everywhere except for Instagram at the Sassy Math Teacher. So that's my website, my TikTok, my Facebook, and YouTube. And Instagram is just the Sassy Teacher. All right. So make sure y'all connect with Asia. Uh, she's got a lot of great resources and services that she's providing to math teachers all across and all other teachers as well. She has other things too. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we, we mention that. So make sure y'all check out the Sassy Math Teacher website. Thank you so much. And I, <laughs> yeah, and I hope you enjoy your spring break. Well deserved. Thank you so much, Kwame. This was awesome. Thanks for having me. All right, have a good one. You too. All right, folks. So we're about to end another episode of Radical Math Talk. And as always, I wish you all good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody. <laughs>